what does it mean to lose your life in order to save it? For years, our friends Kate and Rob seemed to have it all. They were warm, intelligent, wealthy, beautiful, and kind. They had good jobs, good friends, and they lived near Kate's family and were happy. Kate had always wanted to have children of their own, and Rob didn't. But she agreed to compromise, and she worked at a nearby school. Then, last summer, after having been married over 20 years, Rob told Kate that he had been reading about polyamory online. He started quoting anthropologists who said that monogamy was unnatural. He said that he had missed out on something and that he wanted to start sleeping with other women. Kate felt inadequate, humiliated, and ashamed. The town they lived in was too small for Rob to do this without everyone knowing about it. And so leaving his wife behind, Rob moved to a city far away. And now, a year later, they have realized that there is no way for him to come home again. For the sake of his fantasy about unconventionality and freedom and pleasure, he has lost the life that he had. Their shared friends, the everyday joys, balance, companionship, happiness, and self-respect is all gone. No matter how desperately he might want it back, he has lost his life. What, fantasy, what fantasies threaten your life? What ideas of success or perfection or pleasure are destroying or diminishing you? We might also ask about the fantasies that undermine our common life. In the presidential election this week, the debate, despite being corrected, Donald Trump falsely stated that immigrants were eating pets in Springfield as if scapegoating poor people would make this nation great. We all know people who overturn reality for the sake of a fantasy. One might say that Jesus does the opposite of this. He helps us to cherish reality, to protect it from the dangers of the illusory. His words keep us from losing what matters most. Now I can imagine the scene just from having been in so many classrooms through my life. Like any good student, the disciple Peter must have felt a, a sense of pride when Jesus confirmed that he was right in calling him the Christ, the anointed one. Peter and the disciples, and perhaps us too, we share a fantasy. We want Jesus to be Christ the King without having to be betrayed, without suffering, without the cross. Along with this, we want Jesus to simply elevate us over everyone else so that we can be honored without ever having to change. We want to save our life without sacrificing anything or prioritizing what is good. Jesus warns us about gaining the world and losing our life in the process. And this morning, I want to talk about two ways that Jesus teaches us to cherish reality to value what matters, to what leads to everlasting joy, to what John's gospel calls fullness of life. So it's a two-part sermon, and this is the first part. The first thing that Jesus shows us is that we are spiritual beings with a spiritual life. Now, people lose what is most important when they forget this, and people around us are. Many of us forget that they are spiritual beings, and they do this for different reasons. They might recognize that really believing in God is not just something that happens in our mind, but obliges us to change how we live. Others lose their life because they put something else in the place of God. It might be money or success or art or creativity or popularity or style or just habitual ways of acting. Idols are not little statues they are the fantasies and desires that we put in the place of God. 
Now, many people, including my friend Rob, they lose their life simply because they cannot imagine that there can be more to existence than they are currently experiencing. They do not see a way for us to believe in a mystery in the existence of the holiness of our life. They haven't encountered a picture of faith that makes sense to them. Now there's a Tibetan story, it's a parable about a king who had four wives that I'm going to tell. And I'm just telling you, it's a parable. At the 830 service, they, people were taking this a little bit too literally. So there was a great king with four wives. His first wife was the oldest, and she loved him very deeply. And although she was profoundly loyal to him, he neglected her. The second wife was thoughtful. She was a great confidant and advisor to the king. The third wife was ravishingly beautiful. At the peak of her physical beauty, he worried about her faithfulness. The fourth wife was the youngest, and the king treated her like the baby of the family. He was always getting her precious gifts. As the end of his life approached, the king knew he was going to die. And he went to the fourth wife and he said, I am going over to the land of death. Will you come with me? And this wife, the youngest, simply replied, no, and walked off. And that's exactly right. At the 830 service, we all agreed. Yeah, that's a pretty rational response. So, uh, uh, but um, this is a parable, remember. The king asked the second wife the same thing. And although she promised to attend his funeral, she refused to go with him. And the, um, and the order's all wrong now too because I got lost. So the, this, the first wife said, no, I'm not going with you. The, the, the third wife, the, so the fourth wife said, I'm not going with you. The third wife said, she was beautiful. She said um, she, would accompany, she would not accompany him to the land of death. And she said, of course not. I'm going to marry a new husband. That's what the third wife said. The second wife said, although she promised to attend, attend his funeral, she refused to go with him. And finally, the king, he gets to the loyal wife, the first wife. She's the oldest one. She's the most faithful one. And he says, will you accompany me to the land of death? And the faithful woman replied, I have always walked with you. I will go with you wherever you go. And the king wished that he'd taken better care of her during his life. Now the point of this story is that we all have four wives. The fourth wife, the youngest, is our body. And no matter how much attention we give to it, ultimately the disabled rights activists are correct. We are only temporarily abled. We are all on the road to disability and ultimately death. The third wife, the untrustworthy one, is our wealth and possessions, which in many cases may be even more unreliable than our bodies. The second wife, the confidant, she represents our friends and family. And no matter how much they may love us, they can only accompany us so far. The first wife is our spiritual self. And we may neglect this aspect of our life, but it is ultimately what matters most. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, the word that Jesus uses for this is suke. It's the um, basis for our word for psychology, the, the study of the self or the soul. Now, Jesus says that we can gain the world, but lose this soul. We can gain money and health and a good reputation and a great family life, and we can do all of this at the expense of our spiritual life. Okay, so the second chapter is beginning here. A second way that Jesus teaches us to cherish reality is his reminder to live as if God, rather than our own ego, is the center of things. Now, I remember as a teenager when I was reading C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, that there was one chapter that was called, Is Christianity Easy or Hard? And the short answer is that the whole point of all Christianity, the Bible, 
the art, the music, the clergy, the ancient writings, the intricate theology, the way the stained glass windows hold the light for us. The goal, the point of all of this is to make us more like Christ. And Lewis says that if that doesn't happen, it's all simply a waste. But being like Christ is a challenge because we want to hold something back to invite God only into certain parts of our life. It's kind of like the spiritual equivalent of having a secret bank account hidden from our spouse. By the way, I don't have a secret bank account hidden from you, Heidi. <laughs> but God does not want our good intentions or our prayer or our time or our money God does not insist on a rigorous moral code. God does not want a clearly defined area of our life. God wants all of us, all of you. And this is both hard and easy. It is hard because it means taking up the cross. It means giving our whole life over to God. But it is easy because we were made for this. And no half measure is enough. We were created to give our life over to something. And if it is not God, then it will be something that ultimately will distort and destroy us. We give our life to God and God gives us a new self. Now, many of you have heard me talk about Soren Kierkegaard. His picture is in the stained glass window. It's the second to last bay on this, on this north side of the cathedral. Kierkegaard wrote a book called Fear and Trembling. And, and the way he wrote it is he imagined and made up a character, Johannes de Salentio. He imagined what that person's personality was like and then wrote the book as if it was that person writing the book. So it's, a, a, it's an odd book. And Johannes de Salentio is someone who wants to have faith, but cannot believe. He doesn't understand the people who believe. So he he says, offer, he repeats over and over, who can understand Abraham? Like Abraham, the man who is willing to sacrifice his child because of what God told him. And so that's the the premise of the story. And in it, um, Johannes Salentio, he distinguishes between two characters. On the one hand, there's the knight of infinite resignation. And this is a person who just kind of makes themselves believe, doesn't completely trust God, but just does it in a very grudging kind of way, right? That's the knight of infinite resignation. He's trying so hard and the beads of sweat are forming on his forehead and he's, 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 he's doing this for God. But he can contrast that with what he calls the night of faith. The night of faith is doing it because he's just illumined by God's love and doing it out of joy. And there are two very different ways of being a Christian. And I want to read a lengthy quote from, from, from um, this, his description of the, in the night of infinite faith. So this is um, Salentio writing. Good Lord! The knight of faith, he looks like a tax collector. I examine his figure from tip to toe to see if there might not be a cranny through which the infinite was peeping through. No, he is solid through and through. He belongs entirely to the world. He tends to his work. He goes to church. If one did not know him, it would be impossible to distinguish him from the rest of the congregation. In the afternoon, he walks to the forest. He takes delight in everything he sees, in the human swarm, in the new buses, in the water of the sound. He is interested in everything that goes on. And this with the nonchalance of a girl of 16. This man has a sense of security and enjoying finiteness as though the finite life were the surest thing of all. How do you describe the joy and lightness one feels when you are really in Christ? It's almost impossible to put into words. And today we begin our stewardship season when we make our promise to financially support the cathedral. And I don't know about you, but I bet I'm not the only one. It has become one of my favorite times of the year, one of my favorite seasons. And let me tell you why. Because each week during this season, we hear from a a seemingly ordinary member of the congregation about the good things that God is doing in that person's life. 
And they've been so inspiring to me. And their stories have lasted over the years too. I still recall various stories that I've heard in this um, setting. We see people who do not believe or give grudgingly, but with joy. Their celebration is contagious and their faith builds up our own. What fantasy is threatening you? How is Jesus helping you to cherish reality? We have a spiritual life that we discover when we are able to let go of our ego. We have found a secret joy in our life together in Christ. 